Welcome to a new edition of France in Focus. I'm Nadia Shabi, and as the country marks 50 years since it was officially legalised, we're looking into the issue of contraception. Nowadays, most French women have easy access to contraceptives, so it's easy to forget that just over half a century ago, taking the pill was illegal, and it would take a further seven years for the medication to be subsidised by the National Health Service. Well, let's take a look back at this major political and social shift. With the second wave of feminism in France came the desire to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Various methods of contraception have existed for centuries, though early forms were rudimentary and even dangerous. Thanks to progress in science and medicine, women were finally able to buy more efficient methods in the 19th century. Flash forward to the United States in the 50s, where researchers developed the first chemical-based contraceptives. Anticipating the winds of change, John Rock and Gregory Pincus tested the effects of progesterone in animals and conducted research on chemical contraception in women, paving the way to the development of the first birth control pill. But much of the credit for the creation of the oral contraceptive went to Carl Gerasi. Nicknamed the father of the pill, Gerasi successfully synthesized progesterone to create the key ingredient in the birth control pill. Norithindran that he produced was the progesterone that was in some of the very earliest pills in the 1950s, and it has stood the test of time. Even today, uh, it is used by, in some of the pills that are on the market today all over the world. So Jurassic's pill has gone on a long time. This was the very first time that there was a possibility of saying to a woman, you take this uh, medication and you really won't get pregnant. In France, the influence of the Catholic Church and concern about birth rates would present significant obstacles to the development of contraceptives until the 60s, when the women's liberation movement and legal battles would result in a historical breakthrough. In 1967, the Newworth Law, named after Lucien Newworth, legalized birth control in France, but women would have to wait until 1974 for the pill to be covered by Social Security. Around the same time came the development of family planning and sexual education, both geared at increasing information and access to contraception. And along with greater freedom for women came radical changes in societal mores. I think one has to admit that once the, the pill was there as a method to enable people to have sex when they didn't necessarily want a baby, uh, it, it, it was influential in the so-called swinging 60s. It was a factor in the change in society that is summarized in that way. Um, and some of that was good and some of it was, was not so good, we have to admit. I mean, there's an explosion of sexually transmitted infections which has gone on ever since. But France has continued to expand access to contraception. In the early 2000s, the government updated its 1967 law, significantly widening access to emergency contraception for minors. So how widespread is the use of contraception in France, and what are the methods favoured by women here? Take a look. In France, 70% of women use some form of contraception, the birth control pill, is the most commonly used method. Legalized in 1976, it quickly became a symbol of sexual liberation and of women's rights to control their bodies. But the pill is just one of many forms of contraception. The IUD or intrauterine device is the second most popular contraceptive method in France. Inserted by a doctor, it's effective for up to 10 years. Implants and patches can be placed under or on the skin respectively. Implants can last three years, while the contraceptive patch must be replaced every month. Other methods of contraception include vaginal rings, the diaphragm, spermicide, and female condoms. From 2000 to 2010, 50% of women used oral contraceptives. Since then, controversy surrounding the pill has seen that number drop. Last year, only 36% of women still used it. As for men, condoms remain the preferred contraceptive method. Well, to tell us more about how women's access to contraception has changed French society, I'm joined by sociologist and researcher Nathalie Bajos. Hello, thank you for being with us. Hello. Uh, now, what's the biggest and most lasting social impact of women's widespread access to contraception here in France? 
contraception has undeniably helped change women's social status in France since the end of the 1960s. However, we mustn't forget two other major factors that triggered this evolution. The spectacular increase in school enrollment rates among women and the massive amount of women joining the workforce. So I would say contraception was one of the factors that led to this evolution of women's social status, even if it's important to remind ourselves that gender inequalities still persist today. And do all French women have the same access to contraception or do geography, education and income play an important role? The question of economic inequalities and access to birth control in France was already there when contraception was legalized in 1967. Initially, it was women from the higher social backgrounds who started using the pill, and then it started to spread throughout French society and different social layers. A few years later, we saw the same thing happen with the IUD, the interuterine device. But what's new since 2010 is a sort of return to economic equalities in determining access to contraception, with the financial crisis as a backdrop. We've seen wealthy women switch to the IUD when they stop taking the pill, which is a more effective method. While those who were less wealthy had a tendency to go for so-called natural methods, which are a lot less effective. And is there also a generational shift in the attitude to contraception? The question of a generational effect is actually quite fundamental. I'd say there are basically three generations of women who've known legalized contraception in France. Young women today, their mothers and their grandmothers. The latter belong to a generation which was aware of the political importance of legalizing contraception. For their daughters, so women who are in their 50s today, the pill already existed when they started having sex. The feminist struggle was a lot less important to them, and they started talking about potential side effects of the pill. That's something their mothers didn't deny, but which they saw as secondary compared to the potential benefits of the pill. And then today we have the third generation, with young women today increasingly challenging the power of medical science on their bodies. There's still a minority, but it's a growing movement that's questioning this over-medicalization of contraception and this need to control women's bodies. Currently, the onus is almost exclusively on women. Uh, should men be more involved in this issue of contraception? The role of men in contraception is an important question. In France, they mostly use condoms or some have vasectomies, but that's rarely used. But men rarely have their say, so it's a real challenge to implicate them into the decision-making process surrounding contraception. Nathalie Bajos, thank you very much for having spoken to us. Thank you. Now, as we've heard, contraception has changed the lives of generations of women, and taking the pill has become very much the social norm here in France. But in recent years, a number of scandals has led to a drastic fall in the number of women taking the pill. Take a look. French women turning their backs on contraceptive pills. A symbol of their emancipation in the 1960s, it is now linked to serious side effects, such as phlebitis and thrombus, known as blood clots, which can lead to cardiac arrest. According to the French medicine agency, the pill is the direct cause of 2,500 phlebitis cases and 20 premature deaths. French journalist Sabrina de Buscat investigated the side effects. She now accuses researchers and the government of malpractice. What I'm questioning is why, over a period of 60 years, society hasn't tried to develop better methods, to do more to put an end to the side effects of contraceptives. And we're only talking about the serious side effects. We aren't even discussing the number of women who will lose their libido using the pill, depressions, things that are difficult to quantify but which impact women's well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. The pill is the most widespread contraceptive in France. 
but its usage has steadily decreased. In 2010, 45% of women used it. Last year, only 36.5% did. A decline which was accelerated by a medical scandal. In the fall of 2012, 19-year-old Marion Lara pressed charges against the third-generation pill after suffering from a stroke. My life changed. I came out with hemiparesis and my speech was impeded. No one should take the third generation pill. No one. Nowadays, it is mostly the second generation pill which is prescribed by doctors. They check the woman's age, weight and their past medical records because those three factors can increase the side effects of its oral administration. However, Gynaecologists who work in tandem with laboratories say that for a vast majority of women, the pill isn't dangerous. Everyone knows that when the pill went on the market 60 years ago, it increased the risks of phlebitis. Phlebitis has always been considered a regrettable secondary side effect, sometimes a serious one. But the risks are much lower than the benefits brought by the contraception. Following the fall of the pill usage, doctors fear an increase in abortions, even though for the moment a significant increase hasn't happened. Well, that's where we're leaving this edition. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to Koswinket. Reporters. Presented by Mark Owen. The world's first climate refugees flee the Caribbean island of Barbuda, since devastated by Hurricane Irma. The authorities took the unprecedented decision to evacuate the entire population to the neighboring island of Antigua, where they are now living in makeshift accommodation. The larger countries have not quite stepped up. They are really the profligate users of uh, fossil fuel. So clearly, they are contributing to uh, climate change, to uh, warmer seas, uh, more frequent and ferocious storms or hurricanes. And at the same time, we're not seeing that type of responsibility in terms of assisting in loss and damage. Our reporters have been to meet some of those who have returned to the devastated island and still hope for support from the international community. Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.